people who have, you know, unique interests. Also, podcasting doesn't necessarily have to be competitive the way that certain other industries are, right? Because your RSS feed, it lives on, it's ongoing, it's evergreen. You know, you don't think about competing with your peers in the same way that maybe an architect competes for work and jobs and pitches their designs over your designs and who's better and things like that. So yeah, it's a friendly group of people for sure. Podcast Junkies episode 270. Welcome back. I'm your host, Harry Duran. If you're new to the show, it's the one where we seek out interesting voices in podcasting and get them to share a little bit about their shows, their personalities, and what else is on their mind. Last week, we had a great conversation with Ever Gonzalez. He's the host of Outlier On Air and the founder of the Outlier Podcast Festival, one of my favorite festivals, and happy to see that he's bringing that conference back on track. He limits the attendance to about 200 folks. And it really makes for an intimate setting and one of my favorites. So make sure you check one of those out if they are in a city near you. This week, we speak to Lauren Popish, founder of The Wave Podcasting. The Wave offers educational resources, digital community, and podcast audio editing services exclusively for women. And they recently launched their first podcast editing service for women called Swell. Lauren's passion for creating spaces that inspire comfort and confidence come from her 10-year career in commercial interior design and real estate. She also hosts her own podcast, Book Wine Club. Full show notes available at podcastjunkies.com forward slash 270. This episode is brought to you by Patreon. You put everything into making your podcast perfect. You love it. Your fans love it. But you're getting bigger. More and more people are listening every day, and now you're worried about losing some of the magic that makes your show you. So how do you keep your creative control? On Patreon, people power your podcast, not networks or advertisers, so you can turn down those crappy ad deals you know your listeners are just skipping over, or say no to networks that care more about putting money in their own pockets than you getting paid. Your biggest fans get access to exclusive shows, ad-free episodes, and bonus content, and in return, you get a steady, predictable paycheck from the people who love what you're doing. Sound good? Build and grow your podcast your way with your listeners. Start your Patreon today at patreon.com. That's P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com. Remember, if you enjoyed this episode or past episodes, leave a rating and a review at ratethispodcast.com forward slash podcast junkies so we read it out on the air. Experiment with one of the newest podcast apps that support direct podcaster patronage, newpodcastapps.com. This episode is brought to you by Focusrite and specifically the Scarlet 2i2 sound card, one of my favorite go-to sound cards, something I use for each and every podcast recording. The 3G line is a go-to for all new podcasters. Find out more at podcastjunkies.com forward slash focus right, and the link will be in the show notes as well. Okay, without further ado, let's get into this interview with Lauren. So Lauren Popish, founder of The Wave Podcasting and host of two shows, which we'll get into in more detail in a little bit. Thank you for joining me on Podcast Junkies. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so happy to be here. (laughs) I know I sound like a broken record on the show, but I have the benefit of picking guests that are in podcasting. And I don't know if I thought about it too much in the beginning in 2014, but there's a benefit to people coming on with really great sounding mics. (laughs) There you go. You never have that guest fuzzy guest problem. Man, I still haven't figured that out yet with my clients. It's like a daily challenge. So for the benefit of the listener, you've got the SM7. Is it the, oh, you've got the new MV7, is it? No. SM7. SM7B, right? Yes. Yep. And, but I've got the big fat pop filter on it because I live in a weird old farmhouse at the moment. So I'm just trying to reduce any friction that's happening. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, it does look a lot like the new one, the new USB only one. MV7, I think that's it is, right? I'm desperate to try it. I've been recommending it to clients a bunch, but I haven't used it yet. Yeah, that's my new go to recommendation as well, just because to get the quality and the sound that you get with like a sure product. And I'm on the Sam, I'm using the Samson Q2U now, which is also a great starter mic. But now I have it's funny because I have the Samson as my beginning recommendation, the MV7 as the mid, and then the SM7B as the pro. Exactly the same for me. Exactly the same tiering. 
great podcasters think alike. <laughs> so let's start with the farmhouse. Where's that at? Yeah, I have a permanent residence in Los Angeles, but for the summer, I am in upstate New York in a little town called New Paltz. And me and my fiance are renting an old farmhouse. When I when I say old, like we're talking 1800s. Mm, cool. And it's a house of a family friend, but it has been not lived in recently. So there's just a lot of quirky things happening. Our boiler broke. That was being fixed today. There's like some weird things on the mantle happening behind me that I was told I can't touch. It's a place of mystery. It's like, you know, I'm ready to just start a podcast about the things I find in this house because Lord knows there's some good stuff. Do you keep tabs of how many ideas you come up for podcasts? I try not to, but yeah, we've got Google folders, <laughs> Google Drive folders just full of full of things. And uh, fellow podcaster Ariel Niesenblatt recently had a tweet go pretty viral uh, as of this recording. And we're in mid-July now, but uh, I think she said, I spoke to her a couple of days ago. She said she was at 105,000, I think. <laughs> I was literally just looking at this tweet yesterday, podcast idea to young people trying to explain to their parents what they do for a living. Genius. It's so funny because I think you would think that something like that is something that's been shared a lot, but it just speaks to all these ideas for podcasts that people create that are not good. But when you have something that resonates, it's interesting to dissect it and people's interest in it. And also as a podcaster, as a podcast producer, like to kind of look at it from so many different angles. And I think the simplicity in what she said was that it struck a chord with everyone across all generations, <laughs> you know, no matter, you know, this is not a technology issue. I mean, I mean, it, it gets harder, I guess, with more technical jobs. But uh, you know, I remember when I had my some of my earlier jobs, I was still trying to explain to my parents <laughs> what I did. It's like the job of a young person to be confusing to their parents and grandparents, just like baseline. Like you could just work as in classic print newspapers or something, and your grandparents would still be like, but but when, but how do you get it? How does it upload? Like, what is that? And you're like, what? No, like, it's just the job to be confusing. And I think you're so right that when something lands, like when something resonates just on a universal human level, it just multiplies, right? It just takes off. Someone go snatch up that idea, man. Oh, yeah. She's got a couple of uh, production houses who have said they'd produce it for her. And there's like a whole team of folks that have said they want to work with her on it. Some people have volunteered to co-host. So she's trying to figure this all out. I mean, I, I can't imagine how it doesn't happen at this point. And I've had her on my show. Like we've known each other for a while. And actually tying it all back to Westchester, she's from Long Island. I grew up in Yonkers, New York. So I know New Paltz, actually. I dated a girl once who went to SUNY, Paul, SUNY New Paltz. Oh my gosh, long distance. <laughs> and I've lived in LA. So I've lived four years. I was in Silver Lake. And I'm currently in Minneapolis now. So I've been on both coasts and now... Right in the mids. Yeah, right in the mids. And the short answer there is it's because of love because this is where my girlfriend is from. So when people ask, like, what are you doing in Minneapolis? So yeah, so there's a lot to... Like in terms of what, what Ariel was doing and then the fact that she's, you know, from there and but she we work together in LA. So it's been fun to watch her journey through podcasting as well. We tried a project when she was managing a co-working space in Los Angeles. And she's always talk about someone who like eats, sleeps and breathes it. She's also community manager for Squadcast. So <laughs> finger on the pulse, but it's nice when we all get to geek out, you know, about podcasting. It's such a small community and, you know, she has put me in touch with so many people. She's such a connector and we keep referring each other back and forth to different folks in the industry. But that is what is so fun to be in a niche like that, like to just be in the mix of an industry. You keep running into the same people. And I know when I, in a former life, when I was working in interior design and architecture, not a small industry necessarily, 
but still felt small all the time. You know, architects only having architects at their own parties. And (laughs) that's how I met my fiance. Architectural conferences. Yeah, exactly. And the same people keep showing up. So, you know, if you're, I think it's a good takeaway for like, where do you find community? Just go get in the mix of the thing that you're interested in because those people are going to point you in the right direction. There's always a connector like Ariel being pushing people around. Super, super connector indeed. Are those industries as welcoming design architecture? And I asked that because my girlfriend's a photographer and she noticed because she met a lot. She's come to conferences and she's actually done, you know, connected to a lot of the same friends that we have now. And she noticed a difference in, in podcasting. Like everyone's very helpful. Like they always want to help you and they're just like quick to make good friends. And she said, yeah, it's very different because it's not like that in the photography industry. <laughs> No, I think you're probably right. I think there is podcasters are uniquely helpful and friendly towards each other. I don't know why that is. Like, I couldn't put a reasoning behind it other than it attracts really people who have, you know, unique interests. Also, podcasting doesn't necessarily have to be competitive the way that certain other industries are, right? Because your RSS feed, it lives on, it's ongoing, it's evergreen. You know, you don't think about competing with your peers in the same way that maybe an architect competes for work and jobs and pitches their designs over your designs and who's better and things like that. So yeah, it's a friendly group of people for sure. When did you know you wanted to be a designer? Young, like... I guess it feels young now, but not like I, it's not like I was a kid and was like, I want to definitely pick out the wallpaper for this room. (laughs) You weren't sketching like uh, Picasso's at two. No, definitely (laughs) not. In fact, I think my first career that I was like, yeah, I want to do that. If being a hair stylist, I think it's called a hair stylist. Now at the time I was going to be a hairdresser and no, I knew I wanted to get into interior design in high school. I was just really loving what I felt like I could create with space and feeling inspired by space and was reading a lot of books by interior designers and architects that that I found inspirational and worked for a local interior designer and just thought that was so cool. I thought I could combine everything and uh, went to interior design school and moved to New York and became a commercial interior designer. And um, yeah, I don't do that anymore. But (laughs) that's how I started off. Yeah. Well, it's interesting because one of the magazines I used to like looking at was Dwell. Is that the one with like the super fancy, like modern? (laughs) Dwell's where it's at. Dwell, yeah, will keep you up on your phone at night when you want to go to sleep. That's probably like a a Instagram account now, which is just as nice to look at, I'm sure. (laughs) Yeah, I've always been a fan of like modern design. I had aspirations for uh, architecture, actually, when I went to Syracuse, but I didn't get in. And there's probably a reason for that. But I've always been fascinated by by design and just buildings. And you leaned more towards interior as opposed to architecture, like building. Is there something about the aesthetics of like lived in spaces that's uh, attractive to you? Yeah, I'm not sure why my creative leaning went towards interiors, other than the fact that for me, it's easier to visualize the way that people move through space as opposed to my fiance worked as a architect for many years, designing large high rises in New York City. The scale of that takes a different visioning, right? You have to be able to think about the scale of like 42 floors and, you know, thinking about the way that windows intersect and, and obviously a large part of their job is also a very practical one around structure and things like that. I was way more interested in how micro decisions about furniture or finishes could actually impact or change the way people live, work, dine, enjoy, entertain themselves. That to me, the impact of your design decisions was always the interesting motivator. But I'm not surprised to hear that someone who works in what is ultimately a creative field, podcasting, had interest in in space and design because 
creative is creative, you know, coming up with ideas, problem solving, it all comes from the same place, I think. I even took a design class later on in New York City. And I think I've always had a, a visual eye for it. And I love like UX, UI design. And so I never studied formal design, but I could tell you if there's like two spaces after the period in a sentence. <laughs> so I could tell you if there's not an even like white space border around the graphic, you know, and that's why I love Canva because it's got, I'm like Canva's like made for me because I don't need to learn the difficult tools, but I know visually like what I want to see. So always had an appreciation and a love for really good design. That's interesting that you now work in spend all your time in a non-visual <laughs> medium. What do you think that's about? Well, it's interesting because when, so, and again, for the benefit of the listener, you've heard this again, but for new folks, this is a brand new story I'm about to tell you. So listen in. <laughs> I was in corporate for like 20 plus years. I worked at JP Morgan Chase and E-Trade. And then when I was making that transition, I grew up DJing actually. My passion is electronic music and DJing. Like I have turntables and vinyl. And so that was like, that ability for like one person to like, you know, dictate the energy of a crowd. It was always, always fascinated me. So I started, I created a mobile app with a friend, which led me to pursue podcasting because I thought I was going to create a podcast to promote the app. And so I went to New Media Expo in Vegas in 2014. Pat Flynn was there, Amy Porterfield, Cliff Ravenscraft. And I was like, whoa. And then I sort of shifted gears and I started Podcast Junkies because I was like inside the actor studio, but for podcasters. <laughs> right, exactly. So I was off and running. But interestingly enough, in those early days, I had a bit of a background with audio production because of the electronic music production I did. So I was using a really complicated tool to edit, but I was doing it all. I was everything you can imagine in the beginning, booking guests, finding the guests, recording the guests, editing the stuff, you know, writing the show notes as I was editing, <laughs> posting it to my website, learning WordPress, like all this stuff. You have to figure out creating the graphics, creating the cover art, episodic artwork, how to promote it, getting the socials. And so sounds exhausting, but what I learned is, and similar to something we can talk about with you as well, is uh, now founder of Fullcast, our done for you podcast agency, and we help business owners launch shows, but it's everything that I learned doing it myself. And those early days, I think that eye for graphic design helped in me create like my artwork and then help early clients because I was just doing it all. So I, I think you never know like when the pieces will fall into place, you know, looking forward. But when you look back, you're like, oh, okay, I see it's all getting tied together. Well, and a brand is so much, a podcast is a brand when it's done right, yes. right? Yeah. So a brand is more than, it's more than colors and visual things as well. It's feeling and, and values and all of those things too, but it's not just audio. It, it has to be identifiable to the eye, to the ear, and uh, emotionally as well, if you're really you know, doing everything right. So yeah, it's helpful. <laughs> and I, I think I, I sort of stumbled into a, a design that was really eye-catching because essentially Podcast Junkies is just the the road yellow <laughs> and then the black font. So super, and then later on you, you learn, oh, high contrast, it's a good thing. Like sans serif, like big fonts. I'm like, okay, so I always say I'm going to change it, but at, at some point it's it's almost like a brand now. And I'm like, I can't put my face on my cover art. It's just, it is what it is. <laughs> totally. I'm with you. I'm telling you, I was just designing some cover art for a client before we got on this call. And she's like, I just, I want it to feel layered, like textured, like I need a lot going on. And I was just like, it's just not as effective as something that's simple and clean and high contrast and not just messy, 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 <laughs> but busy, busy, busy. Yeah. But you know, it's not my podcast. <laughs> But you learned the basic in design school about like even the fonts, like they always tell you, like, can you shrink it? Can you make it black and white? And is it still recognizable as a brand? And yeah. And some of those like early lessons, I was like, they stuck with me because when you look at podcast art, typically it's like you're looking at it on a phone or far away and or just in the ocean of like 50 other shoes. <laughs> so <laughs> you notice really quickly which ones pop out. No, you're exactly right. So tying the interior design back and bring it into podcasting. Have you been able to create the perfect listening environment for a podcast? Listening environment? Nobody talks to me about the perfect listening environment. They only talk to me about the perfect recording environment. <laughs> you know, the perfect listening environment, I'm stereotypical kind of gal. The best podcast listening environment is on the go for me. Okay. I'm a um, 
someone who just has to feel like I'm being productive all the time for better or for worse. So if I'm doing dishes, I want to be learning or laughing or catching up or whatever. So I very rarely sit to listen or just be (laughs) stand still to listen. I mean, is the car not the best listening environment? I don't know. I that, that that's certainly my favorite. It's funny because when I would make tracks, electronic music tracks, I would go preview them in the car. <laughs> I would go in the car and I'd play them, and then because it's it's almost like it's like a sound booth in there. Totally. So it's, yeah, it sounded really good. That's um, a great idea. Hopefully, you'll be commissioned one day to like someone will say, "Hey, I want a room where I want to go in and listen to my podcasts," and then you could create like a just the perfect chair and <laughs> just like nice visuals and stuff like that. So, well, the reason I got started podcasting is because I wanted to create good recording spaces. So for podcasters, I was obsessed with the podcast studio. How do you make it more conducive to do the work that we do as podcasters? So how do you make it more comfortable or a place that makes you feel more confident? Or makes your guests feel at home too. Exactly. How do you make your guests comfortable? How do you stay energized through a long conversation? Like all of those things can actually, in some part, be solved for in your environment. It's part of the reason I'm only a little disappointed by having to go fully virtual because the in person experience has so much more to do with the environment that you create for you and your guests. But that was my big idea for the wave initially is I wanted to create beautiful, well designed studio spaces for women. And then the pandemic hit and I had to transition my business to be digital and find how I could serve women still serve them and still make them help them be more confident, still help them produce good shows, but without having to deal with them in person. I want to get back to space eventually, but you know, digital, there is the benefit of accessibility and reaching all those wonderful people who you wouldn't be able to help otherwise because they don't live in Los Angeles or they don't live in New York. That to me is the biggest benefit. But the initial vision was like build a real estate business around podcasting. So talk to me about where that idea comes from. What was on your radar? What were you listening to? Or who introduced you to podcasts? I'm always fascinated by origin stories. Yeah, I had a really great work friend who, you know, when they talk about a work husband, right? You're, or work wife. So this was my work husband. He was actually my intern, but which is a total joke because he was like older than me and more experienced and all those things. Like I should not have an intern ever. <laughs> but at the time we were both working at the same architecture firm and he, he was like, hey, have you like listen to podcasts? And so the podcasts we got really into were ones on Comedy Bang Bang. We were really kind of obsessed with whatever. I don't love Scott Ackerman, but like, maybe don't keep that in. I don't know if we have some (laughs) Scott Ackerman fans out here. I don't want to, don't at me. No, Um, no, no, no. Here's the thing. Like it's a subjective podcast or subjective. Like totally. There's people that we know that don't like Joe Rogan. (laughs) We do know those people. Yeah. Yeah. And I think it's fine. It's, and you could like a person on one episode and then because of the, the dynamic with their guests on another episode, you could be like, Oh, no, not my thing. So perfectly fine. And yeah, it's normal podcasting. Yeah. Thank you for that reminder to our listeners to don't come after me. (laughs) Yeah, I we just became obsessed with this comedy podcast. And it was like, full of opportunities to have inside jokes and listen while we were working. And it felt like a little secret society of humor and jokes. And when we would listen at the same time, we'd laugh at the same time. And so it was just like, it was a really fun bonding opportunity before this must have been 2014 about. So, you know, this was before I had a bunch of friends to talk to podcasts to about podcasts, right? I didn't have a big community of people who listened. But it wasn't clear to me that I would start my own podcast for another four years, that it just was an opportunity to be a part of a very small community and connect with friends in an interesting way. But it became more of a 
reason for me to start thinking about podcasting because as I was progressing through my career, I left design and moved to a real estate tech company. I was working in tech and I worked in sales and product management and all these different roles. I had kind of developed a late in life public speaking fear that just like grew and kind of like overtook my professional life. And so I felt like I needed a place to practice and flex my muscles as a speaker. I just had no confidence, just like my speaking confidence was absolutely obliterated. Did you say it got progressive, like it wasn't bad, and then you started noticing it got got worse and worse? Yeah, yeah. So I was like a very confident speaker as a young person. I was in theater. And like I said, I was in sales and did a lot of speaking as a part of that job. And then went to a routine client meeting and had a panic attack just brought on by illness in a big crowd. And it just changed me. Like I couldn't look at speaking again I the same way. And I actually ended up having to leave this role because, I mean, I thought it was going to really end my career. It was of a phobia status. I just couldn't, I couldn't trust myself to speak well or trust my body to not fail me in a public setting. Like I, it was just very, it was the first time I had ever realized that speaking could be scary, which I think is an experience that most people have at different, like much earlier and therefore maybe wouldn't have seen it as so shocking or new, but that is what happened to me. And so at the time I just stopped like, I stopped raising my hand for opportunities, basically. In my personal life, in my professional life, like I had a friend ask me to read something at her wedding and I had to decline. That sucks. Like, that's not cool. And so I was just desperate for, I knew that I needed to get some confidence back in around speaking. It needed to be a safe environment. And I knew that I needed to build, start thinking about my personal brand and how I wanted to build a reputation around the things that I knew and the person that I wanted to be. And podcasting felt like this really great, safe way for me to flex a muscle that was weak and build a brand that was based on authenticity, like just be able to be myself, but be safe. But it also allowed me to empathize with other women and other people who suffer with speaking anxiety. It allowed me to be more empathetic with my guests who were just friends and would come in really nervous to come on the mic. And so that was the beginning of starting to think about how you build a company around confidence and how podcasting becomes a medium for confidence and a tool to help empower not just everybody because it does, but specifically women who suffer from this kind of fear and societal pressures to not speak up all the time. So that's really where it came from. And the space that I was creating was an important part of that in the beginning. But as COVID came and the company shifted gears, the mission stayed the same to help empower women through podcasting. And so talk about those early days I can speak from experience, having been in corporate for almost 20 years, like there's nothing that really prepares you for being an entrepreneur. (laughs) FYI, if anyone's listening and about to make that jump, sort of have to surround yourself with a community or or hire a really good coach and and learn to help shorten the learning curve. But I'm wondering what, you know, how that was for you, that transition. And I'm just now getting my entrepreneurial sea legs after probably about uh, seven years of of doing my business. And, you know, it's it's a lot of things you don't learn in those early days. And I'm I'm wondering what the experience like was like for you. Yeah, I still have a healthy dose of imposter syndrome. So I wouldn't say I quite have my sea legs yet. But the experience of shifting from corporate and especially during the pandemic, which I think we'll hear about more and more. And maybe you've already been hearing these stories about how people have made starts during that phase because it was so new and intense and prompted a lot of change in people's lives. It's the same for me, right? Where I thought of this company as a side hustle and then had the opportunity to either take a severance package or find another role in my corporate company. 
And I said, is this not the chance to, <laughs> is this not like a little, almost like a starter fund to go and see if this idea has something real? Yeah. But also early days plus lockdown was just full of like isolation and insecurity. I was and still do beat myself up a lot about how much I can accomplish in a day as like a small shop. It's all about, you know, how much I can get out the door. But I think the biggest shift for me came when I stopped trying to force business models and systems that were based on like guru business advice and really just followed the needs of my audience. And to put that in, you know, give real examples or real detail about that. You know, I didn't see myself as a coach and didn't feel, like I said, confident enough to be an authority and be use my voice to be an authority. So I was trying to force a business model around education, content, 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 right? Just making content, yeah. trying to sell eBooks, trying to sell courses, taking Amy, you know, Amy Porterfield, following her to the grave and just being like, <laughs> damn it, she says it'll work. So if she said so, it's got to work. This is the last $2,000 and I'm going <laughs> to exactly. put it on black here. <laughs> yeah. I mean, we've sort of, I'm chuckling because- it's felt I, that I, way. Yeah. It was a lot of, a lot of hits and misses. And one of the early lessons you learn as an entrepreneur is to be comfortable with failure and just learn how to really get up fast. And I, I, that was a tough one for me because there was a couple of like big missteps early on, but it just, you just have to dust yourself off and just like try the next thing. Otherwise there's no one going to be like, pick you up because <laughs> you're just going to sit there wallowing in, yeah, in your own grief. Who were helpful for you in the early days uh, in terms of allies or mentors? Yeah. Someone I really admire and she's not in podcasting, but She's someone who I think has some real authenticity behind her business and, you know, just has similar values to me. And therefore, I feel like I can trust her point of view. It's Puno. She's now the new host of Girl Boss Radio. But until just recently, she has owned a creative agency called I Love Creatives. And she helps put people in touch with basically companies and individuals in touch with the creative freelancers and contractors that they need to help run their business. But her brand is unique. She doesn't follow the rules. She'll tell you that. She's an Asian American who dresses really silly and talks really silly. And she has never once not been her in her business. And I think what I loved about, you know, being in a her community and really watching her and more than anything in those early days, you can have a little bit of community, but it's a lot of aspiration, right? It's a lot of like looking up to people. And that was certainly the case for me. In looking up at her to her, I felt like she never sacrificed the her own self or her own identity to build her business, that she never built the business that people wanted her to or the Amy Porterfield knockoff company, you know, which is kind of how I felt like my trajectory was going. And so I really tried to just use authenticity as the only brand value that mattered for me. Now, authenticity doesn't equal cash flow, and that's a problem when you're an entrepreneur. But if you start by attracting the people that you want to work with and by exuding the values and the, the parts of your company that you believe in and that are authentic to you, you can start to build a clientele that is genuine, that wants to work with you, that they like the same stuff you do. And I think that's an important first step. So I Love Creatives has been a massive source of inspiration and just getting in the know with a lot of the specifically female podcasters and podcast entrepreneurs. She podcasts. Esprit Devora has been a huge mentor and helps me out. Uh, I mean, like, has every podcaster come on here and been like, yeah, Spree Devore has like really helped me out. <laughs> yeah, we just did round two. Her episode comes out uh, actually this Friday. Oh, good. Yes, she is. I mean, talk about super connector, but she's also just a giver. And when you find those people who are willing to take your fledgling business and trust that it's something good and put you on a panel with other people who are way more impressive than you. I mean, what a gift, you know? Yeah, it's really nice. And that's been part of the community. And that's what I love so much in those early days. I, I was at 
podcast movement. The first one, 2014. Wow. Really tiny. <laughs> and then, uh, so it's been interesting to see even like Jared Easley, Dan Franks, like what they started there. Cause that was a Kickstarter. They were trying to raise $10,000. They had a hotel room in like Fort Worth, Texas. And they're like, we just want to like, I think it was like a one day thing. And very quickly, like everyone who was podcasting in, in our little circle, because I joined John Lee Dumas's group, Podcasters Paradise. So there's a small group of people that I knew from there. But we're like, what? They're like, a conference just for podcasting? Like, yeah, let's <laughs> So we all like, we got so excited to go. So yeah, it's been f- fun to watch. But yeah, this spree, we met in LA when I lived in LA. And the first interview, and we'll, you'll hear it mentioned, is we tried to do it in an outdoor coffee shop but it's too noisy so i was just like let's just do it in i think it was in my car or her car so, so funny <laughs> which sounds weird but the acoustics again were great so that was that was the first one the future of podcasting is just a nice car with microphones <laughs> <laughs> exactly. does that color how you think about your relationships with the people that you work with and the people that are coming into the space and how important it is to make them feel welcome and supported absolutely i do try and be a collaborator over a competitor always, right? I try to give back what people have given to me. But in the same sense, I'm still so humbled when freaking anyone is like, asks me for advice or wants to, you know, get together and talk because, like I said, I still feel new and like a young little baby in the industry. So, it's a compliment, but it's also a way to like give back to the community and try and be the connector that, you know, isn't a natural role for me, but is one that has been done for me and helps me find the success that I've had so far. Absolutely trying to keep that culture of collaboration and culture of friendliness alive. Yeah. And I think it's something that I've been conscious of, this idea of the uh, abundance mindset. And I have a production company. You've got a podcast production company. I've had Harry Morton on from Lower Street and a couple of other folks. Uh, Evo Terra is a good friend of mine. And I think it's this really rising tide lifts all boats feeling of podcasting. And there's just like, I feel like there's a certain group of us that just, we just all want to see each other succeed and we all do different things and, and have different like niches. But I, I think this pie is like so big and there's like so much business and it's, I think it's going to get even bigger as much as I've seen. It's been fun to watch since 2014. Just I've been having this conversation like the past couple of weeks with some other friends in the space. It just feels like it's about to get bigger, <laughs> like much bigger, which is wild. I know it really does feel like we're on the precipice of like a tidal wave of podcast enthusiasm, but you're absolutely right that there is a ton of room for everybody and especially when it comes to production or these different, you know, areas that we're all in, the things that make you unique and your niche and your, you know, just being a, a individual human with individual experiences means that inevitably you will better connect with certain clients and you should want your clients. When someone comes to me and they're not the right fit, I want them to go work with someone that they enjoy. I want to go put them in touch with someone, right? Because it's how we all build good content together. All the work that we do for our clients is ultimately a reflection on us. We want it to be good. We want to connect with our clients. We want them to have a good experience. So you're absolutely right that the pie is big and getting bigger. Yeah, we're all about to be doing really well. <laughs> all of us, right? Abundance mindset. It's all happening. Yeah. And I think there's something about wanting to ensure that when someone says they're going to get a podcast made, that they have a good experience regardless of who does it for them, because it's still kind of new that someone's going to say like, oh yeah, I tried that podcast thing and I paid a company like $10,000 and I've got six episodes and nothing happened. Like, you know, you don't want those stories to start getting out there. And, and, and you'll, you do see like the people at literally like the bottom of the pile offering like edits for like 20 bucks a pop. And I'm just like, I don't even understand how the math works on that even offshore. Like, so, <laughs> so there's a lot of sketchy stuff happening, but I think promoting and supporting colleagues who are, who, you know, do good work, who, you know, take care of clients. And I think is, is really important. I'm with you. We got to, well, it's kind of similar to the concept of rising tides, like all, what is it? All boats in the tide. <laughs> We're all rising up. I don't know. I just made that one up, but the quality rises with all of us too, right? We're only as, yeah. you know, our reputation is only as good as our weakest 
peer. So, or our lowest quality peer, I guess you could say. Yeah, podcasting is great. Everybody should think it's great. It's our duty to like keep the reputation good. So speaking of great podcasting, you are the host of two shows. One is the book Wine Club. Mm -hmm. And the new one is Podcast Like a Girl. So let's, I want to hear the story of the, uh, the book Wine Club first, and then what you have planned with the second one. Yeah. So I was mentioning earlier that I was looking for a way to build a, a personal brand and, and really just show myself it to a wider audience without having to take pictures of myself. Essentially, I was like, how do I show people who I am, but not have to put on makeup and take a <laughs> bunch of photos. And like I said, I was also, you know, looking for a safe way to get some speaking practice. And so podcasting emerged as a great tool for that. So I did what I do when I approach a new side, a hobby or side hustle, which is, I don't just try it out. I like, <laughs> go buy a ton of really expensive equipment, build the whole studio, and then say to myself, what should I be podcasting about? When I was like, oh, I'm going to take up tennis again. It was like, oh, I'm not going to just buy a basic racket. <laughs> I'm going to go buy Nadal's racket. You know what I mean? You got the outfit and everything ready to yeah, go. Exactly. <laughs> oh my gosh. Tennis fashion. Like My drawers are full and I haven't played in a very long time. But Oh, to my side hustlers who just love the shopping of hobbies, like oh, just holler at me. But I, so I remember I was like going into the office and being like, what do you guys think I should start a podcast about? And so I had a bunch of early concepts. One was I was going to do a podcast called Sister Cities. I'm also obsessed with buying URLs as well. So I have like, <laughs> so just buy the URL before anything. So I was going to start a podcast called Sister Cities where I would call my sister and tell her about stories like crazy New York stories from the city. She was living in Colorado. And I was like, you will not believe what happened in New York this week. And that was the podcast. Overheard on the subway. Exactly. It turns out there's already people doing that. And I was going to start one that was like interviewing travel influencers. I was like trying to figure out what it was. And finally, I had to sit down and say, what is it that you like talking about? Like, what could you talk about endlessly? And I was like, oh, that's so easy. Books. Like I'm a massive bookworm and I read, I read about 40 books a year. And so I I was like, why don't I start a book club podcast? But like everybody who's in a book club knows that it's really a wine club, right? You get together to talk about books, but really you're trying to like Come consume for the books, a lot. Stay of, for the wine. Exactly. And get home, you know. Maybe or somehow, somehow, <laughs> if you're in the city, it's you're jumping in the cab. Yeah, exactly. Drink responsibly. Folks. Yes, please. Please drink responsibly and read responsibly as well. And yeah, I wanted to start a book club podcast. And I, I did quite a bit of like competitive research ahead of starting that podcast. And there wasn't anything good. And I know that's hard to believe. But there just wasn't there weren't any good book club podcasts. Now, there's a ton and Oprah just started hers and I was like, oh, girl, quit copying me, you know? Yeah, I know. Come on, Oprah. Yeah. The original. <laughs> She's like, girl, I've had a book club like way before you podcasting was invented. It's like, yeah, very good point. But I started it and just brought in friends to talk about books that we were reading and just like banter about it. I had a clear structure. We talk about the writing and the plot in the first half. And then the second half was all spoilers. So then we'd get into it, but we were drinking a bottle of wine that had been paired with the book. And so- Who did the pairing? My local wine shop, I would like come and tell him the plot of the book and he'd be like, oh, I think it was amazing. He was a savant. Did you give him a shout out? I'm always thinking like sponsorship stuff and now like the producer and me is kicking in. Did you do an ad read for the wine shop? I did do a free ad read for Parlor Wine in Greenpoint, Brooklyn. It was- Wonderful. He got me a- They just got another shout out here soon. Yeah, there you go. I hope they're still there. He gave me a pin, which was our slogan was reading between the wines. And uh, he got a pin made for awesome. me. He was a bibliophile as well. Yes. Yes. He got a little pin made for me. So it was, it was just awesome. But I would just have like friends and family come into my at home studio, drink a bottle of wine on like a Tuesday, get really drunk. <laughs> 
and then talk about books. And it was so fun. I mean, an hour or a 90 minute session, I just left feeling like so connected to these people. It was the first time that I was having conversations that were so intimate. You have no distractions. All you can hear is each other in your ear. All you can see, you're not looking at a screen. You're just looking at each other. I would do it all in person. So all across the seat from you, I just felt like something magic was happening. Magical. Every time I was hitting record and how things kind of grew is because I had built this studio in my apartment and it was kind of cute and fun and feminine more people were coming to me and saying, Hey, well, my friend has a podcast. Can she come record in your studio? And I was like, sure. And it kind of grew to this point where I had this rotation of different people coming in to record using my nice equipment that I bought (laughs) when I didn't know what podcasting was. And I was like, Hey, I think there's something here. Like I think space, but serving women in it, helping them feel comfortable in space. There's something here. There's a reason that these individuals aren't renting out really high quality, you know, studios in Brooklyn. One part is probably cost, but the other is probably aesthetics and like what's going on here. But that's how I got started podcasting. And I'm sad to say that I've sunset or my book wine club podcast. It's on hold. It's on hold. I, the other day I was like, shoot, I think I'm going to have to bring it back because the people who still ask me about it. <laughs> well, you can, it's one of those things that's like, you don't promise that it's going to be weekly or monthly or ever again. And then you just surprise people and now and then like six months. Just throw in an old episode. Just throw in an old episode. And, and those hardcore fans that stuck with you and kept the, the show on their phone would one day just be surprised by an episode. <laughs> Harry, that's such a good idea. I might just like go do a surprise episode bomb. Just do a surprise episode and then don't say anything and don't promote it and then just see if anyone notices. (laughs) My God. Okay. This may or may not be happening. Anybody who's listening. It's going to happen. (laughs) I was so excited. Yeah. But obviously I've learned how good podcasting is for brand building, business exposure, marketing, digital marketing. And so you know, I wanted to create a podcast about podcasting. Here we are, podcast about podcasting. The good thing is there's none of those. So (laughs) if it's not meta, it's not me. And yes, I'm late to the game. But that's really focused on some of the things that we talked about today, which is, it's not necessarily about podcasting craft, right? It's about how podcasting empowers women. That's the goal. It's called Podcast Like a Girl. I've got a co-host. She is the founder of her podcast club, it's called. And uh, we're going to speak to a lot of interesting, both podcasters, but also women who just use their voices in interesting ways. And um, yeah, that's coming out in a couple months here. I can't believe that name hasn't been taken. Right? It's such a good name. Thank you. There's so much in there related to you know, what's been happening in our world over the past couple of years. And and I think you can just hear, there's so much nuance in that phrase because, you know, and we can get into this discussion too, just kind of like the whole idea of like, the, even the phrase, like if you did something like a girl, it was, there was like a negative stereotype around that. And now it's being twisted on, it's one of those phrases that's now being twisted on its head. It's like, yeah, podcast like a girl. So like, it's badass. What of it? <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, you know, it's good. It's going to be great. So what, were you seeing what was happening in your world besides, I guess, the obvious stuff in terms of politics and our current climate and Me Too and all this sort of stuff? But was it just a, a gradual awakening for you? Is this something that has been top of mind for you since you were a little girl? Or what's that journey been like? Yeah, in terms of building a company for women. Yeah, or just even awareness of like speaking up on behalf of women, supporting women, empowering women, like all those things. Yeah, it came from struggling, you know, with this public speaking anxiety. I mean, it's hard to impress how altering it was to the way that I saw myself and how much impact and influence it had on the way I was going through life. But I mentioned that it also helped open my eyes to others who were struggling, who I hadn't been able to empathize in the past with because I was felt like a confident speaker. And I started some research around why, you know, how much of society struggles with public speaking or speaking anxiety of any kind. And the stats that I 
was finding was that there is a majority of individuals who are afraid of public speaking. It's something like 75% of society has some kind of speaking anxiety. That sounds right. But the majority of that 75% are women. So 44%. <laughs> and all I could think was, why would that be the case? Like, why would one gender have more fear about using their voices? And I think the only thing that I could imply, and it is I am implying, right? I'm, I'm making an assumption and taking a guess, but that there are other factors other than just sheer phobia that have impacted the ways that women think about using their voices. It could be that there's all of these conventions around or terms and ideas about what voice should sound like that have been created to be able to speak negatively ab about women's voices, things like vocal fry or being shrill or things like that we say, oh, that's just poor quality speaking. Is it poor quality speaking or is it just a statement about our preference for male voices? Could it be that women are overly criticized for the content of what they say, the things that they choose to take a stance on? Are they, you know, there is some study and some information that women who speak up in meetings or who express their point of view are overly criticized for what they say. So, you know, if that is true, that women's voices are more criticized and that more women than men are out there not raising their hand, sharing their idea, going and telling people about their business and raising capital and sharing, like just having influence in the world and being advocates for themselves with the most authentic tool they have, right? Their voice is it's your biggest marketing promotional tool is your own ability to talk about yourself. If women aren't using that, then what needs to exist to help that? How do we help marginalized demographics? And how do we lift up a population that is struggling with this disproportionately? And so I just let the numbers and the research and my own heart kind of guide me to serve a population that I felt was being underserved at the time. I don't claim to be a, you know, original feminist who always knew that she would work with women. I am a feminist, of course, but I just stumbled into supporting women because I am a woman who was struggling and wanted to help people who are in the same position. I think that's true for a lot of people who solve problems and they're, they're, businesses. It's a problem that they originally had, and they want to solve it for more people. That's an amazing story. Thank you for sharing that. And I think it speaks to this idea of helping a group of people who don't get a lot of attention, don't get a lot of support. I, I like to say that my mission is help, to help a million people find their voice. And I think to that aspect, you know, the, you're helping people who may not have felt comfortable getting help from traditional sources. And I think there's unique challenges that women have and that you can speak to directly. And that's why I think it's it's so important that you're out there as a resource to help even more women find their voice. And the interesting thing about podcasting is the way I think about it, if I'm going to get to a million, I'm not going to speak to a million people, but I can help you know, a couple of thousand people start a show and a couple of those people can have, you know, reach 10,000, 100,000. So you get to that number that way. And I think I think what you'll find and you've probably found already is you're giving, you're create, helping them create these platforms and then they're going on and they're touching like how many thousands and, and millions of people as well. Exactly. It's a ripple effect of impact. So our has flown by. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> as I thought it would. I have a couple more questions as we wrap up, but thanks for being so generous with your time. What's something you've changed your mind about recently? I feel bad because I'm like, am I only podcasting? Like, do I have an th original thought that isn't about podcasting? But I guess I don't. It is a show about podcasting. So it, it can be podcasting related. It could be morning breakfast related. I don't know. Yeah, I guess I don't have an original thought that isn't about podcasting. So I have recently changed my mind about micro content about the future of podcasting in some ways, which I think there is a huge future for narrative storytelling podcasts that we all know and love. But I've thought about 
that possibly there isn't going to be as much room for long form podcasts that, you know, are long interview or don't have a specific niche. But I have changed my mind about that recently. And I think that what the future of podcasting looks like is your content that you're creating that is long form that is being distributed in many different ways that is more consumable and specifically searchable. So micro content, the taking your 30 minute podcast and dropping it into three 10 minute segments for YouTube, taking that 10 minute segment and creating two five minute segments for Instagram, you know, like thinking of many, many versions of your podcast it at many different lengths and how it'll live how you can keep creating long form content as long as you think about it in a way that can be reduced and searchable and uh, micro content can be created from there. I don't know that I have a good stance on it, but it's something that I'm thinking a lot about and help trying to help my clients get their head around and me think about get my head around this new podcast I'm creating, which is like, can you create a long form content? can you create long form content with small content in mind, you know? So I do think there's still so much room for those lovely hour long, 90 minute long conversations that you, that we all love to have as podcasters. That's where all the magic happens is in, is in these conversations. But I think it's the way that content is distributed that will increase its discoverability and consumability in the future. Yeah. Now I feel like we're going to have to have a, uh, Another discussion afterwards and, uh, and a worm. <laughs> that's where the wine comes out. <laughs> and that's podcast wine club. <laughs> there you go. When you get podcasters together, I mean, the ideas just start flowing like crazy. So it's so funny. I just had a thought when you were talking about the wine one, instead of please drink responsibly, you can do please read responsibly. I love that. See? <laughs> so, anyway, so, and I always say that I'm going to do an after hours version of this show where like if for a bonus Patreon only, like you get to Hamir and Lauren, just shoot the shit for like another hour. <laughs> but you know, it's one of those ideas that as with all things podcasters have and just to make them happen. I'd love for this to be a live show too. So I'm like envisioning like doing this on a stage one day. What's the most misunderstood thing about you? All right, here it is. I have lived in really creative city hubs. And I think that living where a lot of cool creatives are is really inspiring, especially when you're young, especially when you're building something. So lived in New York, Los Angeles, we've talked about this. But I am not a big city gal. And I think that's a misunderstanding about who I am. And because I'm always in New York or LA that I was like born here or that I'm just destined for the big city. But I grew up in a small town in Wyoming and my whole family still lives in, I mean, people call it the Midwest. It's not even the Midwest. They're just in the wild West. Like they're just in the middle of the actual West, (laughs) the actual West, South Dakota, Colorado, Nebraska, all of those places. So I love New York and I, I love that I've been able to like take all that these places have been able to offer me, but my heart is still thinking of being a small town gal in Wyoming And I think it's important to know that location isn't a barrier for what you want to create in the world, especially in a digital world. Yeah, it's been something that I've been more conscious of as well. I turned 50 last year. so I And I'm a city boy, basically. I'm in a group in Yonkers, New York. So in the city was my backyard. Lived in there three, four different times, Brooklyn. I love the energy of Manhattan. Like when you pull it, when the cab comes in from the airport and you're crossing the bridge and you're like, phew. It just like hits me like a wave. Your heart rate. I know. It just starts going up. I know. (laughs) And then I love being around crowds and I loved LA because I could walk to stuff. And then it's been interesting to be being here in Minneapolis. And initially we're in a neighborhood you can walk to stuff, but with like all the social unrest that's been happening, a lot of stuff like places boarded up, restaurants closing. I'm like, I think I need a break. (laughs) Like I think I, 
And so we actually just got a new apartment. Like it's only like six or seven blocks in <laughs> from where we are, but it's away from like the main street. And we, I, I was walking on the street and I was like, oh, there's a big tree on the sidewalk and it's quiet. And I was like, those things that you take for granted. Um, so I can, I, I definitely relate to it. I think it, as with all things, it's on the spectrum. And sometimes wherever you are in life, you need more of one than the other. I agree. I agree. It's all about your season of life. Yes. Well, Lauren, thank you so much. I never know where, where these are going to end up. And I've really enjoyed this conversation. And um, I'm glad you, you've you were able to find some time and, and I can't wait for us to connect at a upcoming conference at some point as well. The podcast family just keeps getting bigger and bigger. So that's a good thing. Come on in the, the water's warm podcasters. <laughs> so for folks who want to learn more about the wave and your show, where's the best place to point them to? Yeah. At the wave podcasting on Instagram is where I'm most active on social, but if you like websites, do people use websites anymore? I don't know. Oh my God. My site just got hacked. It's got a malware on it. The site's down. Oh my God. I saw that. I went to it today <laughs> and I was like, what is this? Yeah. Not pretty. Yeah. I'm actually switching away from Bluehost. It's a whole, it's another podcast episode probably. Oh, you hate to see that. Yeah. This is a little rabbit hole, but for those, most people don't know, but there's a company called Endurance. It owns like the 20 top hosting companies like CoSkater, Bluehost, uh, there's a bunch of others. So you think you're going to different hosting companies, they buy them up and then they give you the same shitty service. So HostGator used to be like highly rated. This company bought them. They just threw them into their portfolio. And so you got to do some homework and find like Endurance in Group. It's called EIG or something like that. I was just reading a blog post like yesterday, like the best hosting companies that are not in the EIG, EIG companies like Indies. So now, I mean, thankfully my podcast they exist on Apple and people can f listen to them, but the, the site's down now in case anyone's going there. So, Well, be careful about your web browsing folks in that case. You never know what's going to happen. Thewavepodcasting.com is where I am, but you know what? Just go to Instagram. That's probably, it's probably the best. Yeah. Thanks again, Lauren. I really appreciate you taking your time. Thank you so much. Thank you. You put everything into making your podcast perfect. Now, how do you keep it that way? On Patreon, people power your podcast, not networks, not advertisers. So you can turn down those crappy ad deals and stay in creative control. Start your Patreon today at patreon.com. That's P-A-T-R-E-O-N.com. Thanks to Lauren for coming on the show. As always, full show notes available at podcastjunkies.com forward slash 270. Intro and outro music composed by Cedar and Soil. Cedarsoil.com for his great catalog. Don't forget to check out our sponsor, Focusrite, and their awesome line of gear, specifically the Scarlet 2i2 Pro, at podcastjunkies.com forward slash Focusrite. Podcast production and marketing provided by Focast. Sign up for a free podcast brainstorm at focast.co forward slash chat15. We've got several episodes in progress, so tune in next week for another fantastic conversation with an amazing podcast personality. If you made it this far, you're looking for the retention hashtag. Let's go with the wave Lauren and tag us at podcast underscore junkies and Lauren at wave podcasting. Thanks for all you do to support the show. Have a great week.